Uh, welcome, everyone, today for our uh, Authors at Google presentation by uh, Daniel Wilson, who is a recent PhD graduate from the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University, where he also earned his master's degree in data mining. Uh, Daniel has worked at uh, various top research laboratories, including Microsoft Research, uh, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, and Intel Research. Um, currently, Daniel is columnist for Popular Mechanics, and How to Survive a Robot Uprising is his first book. Um, uh, the movie rights were recently optioned by Paramount Pictures, <laughs> with uh, Reno 911 uh, writers set to write the script. He's currently working on his second book, tentatively titled Where's My Jetpack? Um, we're thrilled, thrilled to welcome Daniel uh, to Google today, and would like to thank him for making a special trip to visit us. Uh, hi, everybody. Yeah, thanks for coming out. This is great. Um, it's especially great as Google already bought all those books, so <laughs> I don't have to actually convince you to buy them. Uh, yeah, th this is what you're supposed to do once you get a PhD in robotics, I think, is uh, go on a book tour. So, uh, yeah, my name's Daniel, and I wrote uh, this book called How to Survive a Robot Uprising. Uh, and really, the title of the book says it all. So this is a book that uh, gives advice to humans on how to survive when the robots inevitably come and uh, try to kill us all. Um, now, if you, if you haven't sort of caught on yet, the book's funny, yeah. And it says humor on the back, too. So that's usually the first thing I say during, <laughs> during a talk. Book's funny. OK. Unfortunately, uh, since the book was published, I actually get lots of emails from people that sort of disagree. Um, and that's, it's really interesting to think about uh, the real robot uprising, but uh, I sort of have to say up front that, and this may be disappointing to you all, but I don't actually truly believe that a robot uprising is on the horizon for us. And I, I, sort, of, I sort of say that from an informed standpoint. Uh, you, know, I, I need, you know, I have a little card that says my PhD is on it. I usually wave that at people. I'm working on getting a badge for it. But uh, I'm going to say to the people that, that are worried about it, I really I don't know what to tell you, except you know, just buy the, buy the damn book. So that's my advice. Um, also, you'll notice, recently I came up with an idea. The book has uh, got a bit of a foil cover. And this isn't scientifically proven, but I'm pretty sure that if you were to line the walls of your basement with it, uh, <laughs> the robots, they can't find you. But you know, that's not scientifically proven, but you know, it's your safety. So what's it worth to you? That's, that's all I'm going to say. So uh, now I want to follow this up by basically saying that although I don't believe a robot uprising is really going to happen, all the information in the book, uh, every robot that I talk about, every sensor that I talk about, uh, all the problems that I talk about that robots have to solve in order to function, all of that is real. And so I did spend the last five years getting a degree, getting a PhD in this stuff, and I Although that doesn't make me an expert in everything, I do luckily have lots of friends who are really smart. And uh, so everything and all the advice in the book uh, is actually comes from real roboticists. And so uh, that's all the people at CMU mostly. So, <laughs> um, so I'll talk a little bit about my background. Um, right, I wrote this book in my spare time uh, while I was getting a PhD. I also got a master's in robotics and a master's in data mining, whatever that is. Um, and while I was at CMU, over time I started to notice that, um, you know, especially in America, when you're watching TV or you're watching a movie and there's a robot, you know, a lot of times they start out good, but uh, it always ends with, uh, you know, human limbs flying in the air and pe people getting killed and the red eyes and the, you know, the spinning heads. And like, over time I became more and more irked by this until. Uh, it finally sort of culminated uh, one night at a bar, um, and I was talking with my friends, and I was kind of griping about this, and uh, then I realized, you know, suddenly that, you know, like all people must at some point in their lives, I was at a point where uh, I was qualified to write a book called How to Survive a Robot Uprising, you know? I realized that I could actually seriously uh, respond to all these uprising scenarios that everyone is so familiar with. And for most people, I think that's all they know about robots, really, or, or what they see on, in movies, you know? And so I wrote the book sort of uh, to strike back at Hollywood, you know, to sort of take them seriously, get it all down, and just answer all the questions, you know, f for good. 
and call out all the, uh, all the stereotypes. So I really like that, the idea for, uh, for that reason. So after I, after I thought of it, you know, the first thing I did was I wrote a lot of jokes, like, um, you know, jokes about uh, how to ingratiate yourself to robot overlords in a post-apocalyptic world, you know, how to, uh, how to make love to robot, things like that, you know, cru <laughs> crucial information granted, but uh, not necessarily based on, on fact, you know, and so the, the first thing that my editor did when he saw uh, the, the sort of initial manuscript that I handed him was he took a blue pencil and he sort of crossed all of that stuff out, and uh, in retrospect, I kind, of, um, I kind of agree with that. The, uh, the idea is that with robotics, a lot of times the fact is stranger than the fiction. So um, everything in the book is really rooted in fact. And so what I realized I needed to do was uh, I had to go around and ask roboticists about uh, how they would deal with each of these situations. So um, if we're talking about a Terminator, well, there are people that work on humanoid robots, um, all aspects. There's, you know, leg bipedal locomotion, um, if we're talking, you know, and vision and things like that. Uh, if we're talking about escaping from an unmanned ground vehicle, you know, there are, there are lots of people that are working on uh, making cars that drive without people. So personally, my research is just in smart homes that track the elderly. So <laughs> although that's going to be really useful, for, I mean, those robots, most dangerous, hands down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So I know a lot about that, you know, so I had this one section that I could write, you know, how to escape from a, from a smart home. And, you know, I, I really had a lot of fun with that section, and it's actually one of the longest sections because I just had so many jokes I had to get in there. Uh, but, you know, what about all the rest of the book? So, so, you know, I went around CMU, and I had a lot of fun. My advisor is actually a guy who is a humanoid robotics guy. And so, you know, I just sort of, after an advisor-advisee meeting, one day, I kind of paused and said, so Chris, you know, let's just say Terminator's chasing you. <laughs> what do you, you know, what, what would you do, you know? And he's kind of like, looks at me out of the corner, <laughs> what are you talking about, you know? And then right about then, a, a postdoc that I was sharing an office with was like, well, you know, what kind of humanoid robot is it? You know, what kind of Terminator? And then it just, you know, it goes from there. And I was really, and that's it, you know. And it's, I was really amazed by how game everybody was to help me out, you know. Once you get them started, you know, they really, how big can a humanoid robot, I mean, how big can a bipedal walker get, you know, as an, like an imperial walker, is that feasible? Well, it has to be passive dynamic, you know, you know, it just goes, and I'm just like scribbling down notes. Yes, oh. so, uh, you know, and actually, I also found something else that was uh, kind of interesting from talking to all these roboticists who varied in age and ex expertise. I mean, I didn't try to, uh, you know, I don't name names or anything in the book. I mean, I have an acknowledgment section. Um, but, you know, I talked a lot with, with graduate students. I mean, I was just interested in getting all the, all the creepy little stories, you know. But, um, but what I found was that I did, in, in one section, I had trouble. So there was, uh, there was oh, sorry, I forgot to mention the one thing I found that was interesting was that uh, whenever you ask these people like why they're, you know, why they're doing their jobs, they just say uh, generally the reason is because they think robots are cool, right? So I mean, you and you really, I really saw that they thought robots were cool, right? Whenever they start talking about them, you know, eviscerating people, ironically, uh, that's whenever it really shined through. So you know, that was kind of nice to see because I sort of thought, you know, maybe I was the only one who, you know saw an episode of Small Wonder and then decided to get a PhD. Uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, I did have trouble with one section and that was the, uh, the, so this is a section that you want to take with a grain of salt. I did my best. It's called How to Treat a Laser Wound. And uh, this, you know, I feel bad because this could be crucial at some <laughs> point in the near future. But uh, I had to actually call, you know, um, physicians, you know, for this. And as it turned out, uh, every place I called, every burn unit I called, no one would give me advice like on the record because um, they were worried about uh, you know being sued over this, which sort of leads me to uh, to just if I just go with that, you know, then what this means is um, we're going to have somebody who buys the book, gets attacked by like a man-eating robot, gets a limb maybe lopped off by a laser, and then comes back and sues me. Uh, I'm into it. That's that's going to be really fun when that happens. <laughs> So anyway, that's just from an Army field manual, that section. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, 
I'm going to hold up my book, as I was instructed to do and forgot. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to actually read from the book uh, for about 10 minutes. Uh, but before I do, I'm going to tell you what kind of advice is, is in this book. So uh, first of all, some of the advice is just plain funny. It's just uh, like jokes that I thought of. Um, for instance, um, you should be suspicious if your servant robot is constantly talking about human killing and making repetitive stabbing movements. So, <laughs> As it turns out, I didn't ask uh, somebody about that. I just made it up and wrote it, but still good advice. Um, and uh, <laughs> did I mention I've got a PhD in robotics yet? <laughs> yeah, PhD, kids. So anyway, some of it's also taken straight from roboticists. Um, so like these creepy little facts. So there's a guy named Metin City, uh, I hope I pronounced his name right, that's that's working at CMU right now, and he uh, makes these robotic geckos and robotic flies. And as it turns out, uh, a robotic fly, it looks like sort of a pencil eraser with wings, but um, it will sound exactly like a real fly, and that's because it beats its wings at the same frequency. It, it mimics the, uh, well, it's not technically aerodynamic. Well, it mimics the way a, a real fly's wings uh, work. And so, you know, that's kind of creepy, right? So every, now every time you hear a fly, you know, could be robot fly, could be a real fly. I mean, there's definitely a probability that leans towards uh, real fly on that one. I'm, I'm going to go on a limb and say that. Uh, and finally, the, the sort of the third flavor of advice is just uh, extrapolated advice. So, um, for instance, I have a section on hand-to-hand -hand combat with, with robots, you know, and so humanoid robots. And, uh, you know, there, so far, as far as I know, there's not any robots that there's not a robot that exists really just to sort of, uh, you know, spar with a human, just to sort of beat him about the head and neck and face. Um, so what I had to do is I kind of had to find a humanoid roboticist and ask about uh, how the arms work and how fast they could, they could uh, throw a punch and things like that and extrapolate that in order to get the advice for that section. Uh, so that said, I'm now going to read from the book for a little while. I'm going to start uh, with the introduction. If popular culture has taught us anything, it's that someday mankind must face and destroy the growing robot menace. In print and on the big screen, we've been deluged with scenarios of robot malfunction, misuse, and outright rebellion. Robots have descended on us from outer space, escaped from top secret laboratories, and even traveled back in time to destroy us. The cultural icon of the killer robot goes back almost as far as the notion of the mad scientists who supposedly create them. Even the word robot has ominous roots. It's Czech for laborer and was coined in RUR, Rossum's Universal Robots, a play produced in 1920 in which robots revolted and destroyed all humans. Who would have thought? Today, scientists are working hard to bring these artificial creations to life. In Japan, fuzzy little real robots are delivering much appreciated hug therapy to the elderly. Children are frolicking with smiling robot toys. It all seems so innocuous. And yet, how could so many Hollywood scripts be wrong? I ask you. <laughs> ask yourself that. How, many mil how could millions of dollars of special effects lead us astray? So take no chances. Arm yourself with expert knowledge. For the sake of humanity, listen to serious advice from real robotics experts. How else will you survive the inevitable, the inevitable future in which robots rebel against their human masters? Okay, now I'm going to uh, gonna read boring part. I'm gonna read uh, an informative part, and uh, I also like to read this part because it contains uh, my favorite typo of the book. Um, okay, this is, uh, and it's a doozy, man, I love it. This is Robot Sensors. Uh, robots are unlike any adversary heretofore known to man. They will use any means available to sense and make sense of the outside world. We cannot even imagine the scope and depth of the information available to them. Though we can roughly define their sensors in terms of human abilities, robots are truly superhuman. A sensor is any device that converts a property of the physical world into an electrical signal. The five human senses are visions, hearing, <laughs> yeah, did you get that, visions? But uh, <laughs> honestly, I'm just standing by it because it's written down, you know? <laughs> it's got, 
some, some credence. Visions, hearing, touch, smell, and taste. Robots have a much wider variety of sensors to choose from, each of which supplies different information and has its own particular vulnerabilities. What matters to us is whether a sensor is visible or hidden. Extrinsic sensors inform a robot about the outside world and are vulnerable because they're usually placed on the outside of the robot. Intrinsic sensors monitor the robot's internal state and may be well protected, often placed deep within the robot. Passive sensors watch quietly without changing the environment. Active sensors, like the sonar ping from a submarine, aggressively inspect the environment. Active sensors may collect more information, but they can also give away the position of the robot. Robots are tough, but their sensors are usually fragile. They can be damaged when exposed to extreme temperatures, vibrations, moistures, moisture, thermal shock, or corrosion. When a sensor receives too much stimulus, it, could, it can become saturated and cease to function. Mishandling a sensor can cause it to detect things that don't really exist, a false positive, or to miss things that are really there, a false negative. In this section, we'll examine the most common sensors used by robots, starting by grouping them into the five human senses and then exploring past human capabilities and into the realm of superhuman sensory ability. And I'm going to skip that section now and get right to some crucial uh, advice which is how to survive hand-to-hand -hand combat, which is, I think, why you're all here today. If you find your, how to survive hand-to-hand -hand combat. If you find yourself in a brawl with a robot, your only hope is to escape. A robot foe won't trade insults, and it can't be intimidated. You should fully expect a swift, pincher-clamping attack without warning. Follow the rules of disengagement. Every second you spend within arm's reach of a robot can take years off of your life, all of them. Destroy or disable exposed sensors. Sensors are by far the most vulnerable, exposed part of any robot. Destroy or disable outward-facing sensors, such as cameras. A handful of dirt, mud, or water will suffice. It's hard for a robot to wipe mud from its eyes when it has whirring buzz saws for hands. <laughs> that's, that's a little technical tidbit that I picked up uh, around the, the FRC. Keep your hair short and your clothes tight. To consider the alternative, imagine getting your hair caught in the garbage disposal. Don't bother with karate unless you can punch through sheet metal. And find a weapon. Your pathetic, ha your pathetic human hands are useless here. Choose a blunt or pointed instrument. Serrated edges don't work against metal or durable plastic. Even a simple crowbar can save your life. You can run away while the robot condescendingly bends it into a pretzel shape. <laughs> Keep your distance. A humanoid robot can block or throw a punch about twice as fast as a human black belt can. In comparison, the typical inebriated human brawler doesn't have a fighting chance. And finally, get away. Pretend that you just lit the fuse on a cheap Chinese firecracker the size of a doghouse. <laughs> um, that vision, that you know, technique really works whenever you need a scamper. So uh, now I'm going to move on to uh, another bit of advice called how to deactivate a rebel servant robot. So you've discovered that your extremely submissive, lovable, and expensive servant robot has turned rebel. This can feel like losing a member of the family. However, if the situation is not dealt with properly, it may feel more like losing every member of the family. <laughs> Plus a few neighborhood kids. Pretend everything is normal. To forestall a mechanized killing spree, you must act as though nothing is amiss. When your servant hands you an old tire half full of rainwater and mosquito larvae instead of an iced tea, simply sip politely, nod, and smile. That's my favorite joke in the whole book. What does that say about me? <laughs> mosquito larvae. I, oh, mwah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's terrible. Send the robot on an arduous task. Not only will sending your robot on a long, tiring task drain its power reserves, it will give you time to formulate a plan. Formulate a plan. Call the cops. The most straightforward solution is also the most costly. A confrontation with law enforcement officers will likely end with your house and servant resembling Swiss cheese. And that's my least favorite joke in the book, actually. Uh, only call the fuzz in a bona fide emergency or if you have an extremely reasonable malfunctioning killer robot insurance deductible. The power drain plan. Instruct the servant, to, servant robot to clean the house, landscape the yard, and assemble several major pieces of IKEA furniture. Then, when your robot is power depleted and attempts to recharge, just shut off the power to your house. Now simply wait until the robot runs out of batteries. If it tries to move, apply pressure with a crowbar. The pool ruse. Use this trick if you have a swimming pool. Throw a, hand of, throw a handful of leaves into the pool and ask your loyal robot to fetch them by hand. 
When it leans over, plant your foot on its metal hindquarters and shove. If your robot is a waterproof model, use the next few minutes to run away screaming. <laughs> Purchase a new manual kill switch. You should harbor no doubts now about shelling out for a reinforced, encrypted manual kill switch, complete with a fist-sized cherry red button. Um, okay. Okay, I'm going to read one that's slightly less funny, in my opinion, and slightly too serious. This one's called How to Fire a Weapon at a Robot. Without the proper preparation, firing a gun at a robot can be as effective as holding the barrel to your own head. Robots are capable of tracking bullets to their origin either acoustically or visually. How then to realize your dream of spraying a robot with hundreds of rounds from a standard assault rifle? Stay alert. Watch for microphone arrays or camera arrays that point in 360 degrees. They won't necessarily be mounted on the robot you're firing at. They may be spread throughout the environment or separately mounted on several robots. Keep moving. Never fire from a static position. A robot might return fire to your exact location within milliseconds. Try to make sure it fires where you were and not where you are. Coordinate your fire with comrades. Spread out, and spread out around the target and begin firing simultaneously. Incoming fire from multiple directions may negate the, bullet, the robot's bullet tracking. At the very least, it will make it less accurate. Choose a complex environment. Waterfalls, street traffic, or adverse weather conditions can drown out the clues that robots use to pinpoint your position. Enclosed environments with many obstacles and surfaces can muffle or reflect sounds, further concealing your firing position. Uh, and finally, modify your weapon's acoustic signature. When you fire a weapon, a robot's acoustic bullet tracker listens to the sound vibrations from the muzzle blast and the supersonic crack as the bullet speeds along. A silencer can foil some acoustic detectors. Okay. Let's see now. Okay, so finally I'm going to read um, one that's probably too funny. And this is uh, another crucial section called How to Pose as a Humanoid Robot. Uh, during an infiltration or escape, you'll need to pass unnoticed by robot surveillance. Most robots will be readily identifiable to each other through encrypted markers. How will you convince the robots that you're warm, warm circuits wrapped in a thin candy shell? Pretend to be damaged. A damaged robot may exhibit strange behavior while failing to transmit identification. Change your heat signature. Stuff aluminum foil in your pants. Rub your exposed skin with cool mud. Hang a hulking piece of gold metal around your neck and slip into an Adidas jumpsuit. <laughs> I mean, that's just good advice. Your heat signature will not match a healthy robot, nor will it match a healthy human being. Make some noise. An occasional screeching beep or boop should suffice. Make it quick and strangled. This is no audition. Finally, move like a robot. Early robots exhibited a trademark clumsiness that spawned a dance called the robot. <laughs> Contemporary robots are more dexterous, unless they're broken. Pretend you're either damaged machinery or a well-oiled breakdancing machine and pop and lock your way into the heart of robot territory. <laughs> you guys already know how to pop and lock, right? Because that's a whole other book if you don't. <laughs> and possibly a, possibly a video. <laughs> if confronted, keep moving and don't look back. You're just a poser. So ignore other robots and pretend to be completely oblivious to the environment. Keep your head down and shuffle forward with a steady, even pace. The fate of the entire human race may depend on it. OK, and finally, I'm going to read uh, the, the introduction to the last section of the book, which uh, should get you guys all riled up and ready to uh, fight some robots. We're not. Silicon versus gray matter, winner takes planet. We may have won a few battles, but humankind must win the war. Most likely, the epic struggle of man versus robot will not be fought by soldiers on a smoky battlefield. It will be acted out by average men and women and their unruly appliances. This is the morning that you wake up and your toast is not made, your house is not cleaned, and your television only shows static. Outside the window, robotic lawnmowers are chasing people down the street. Inside the house, the vacuum cleaner is eyeing you angrily. At last, we turn to the purpose of this book and the plot of a thousand doomsday science fiction stories, How to Survive a Robot Uprising. There are many potential causes of a mass robot uprising, a programming mistake, mistreatment by humans, or lust for gold. One thing is for certain, a robot uprising will affect every person in an industrialized nation. Wherever there are people who enjoy purchasing time-saving gadgets at low, low prices, there will be robots to serve them. 
Densely populated city centers will be hard hit, and the peaceful suburbs will be overrun. Paved roads and sidewalks that allow access to humans with disabilities will also accommodate the wheeled robot masses. The twisting dirt paths of the wilderness may offer natural resistance, but as we know, robots can invade any domain, however inhospitable. When it arrives, the robot uprising will be a coordinated war between the two greatest intelligences on the planet. Human survival hinges on our alertness to the growing robot threat. The robots that we use daily, those we may even call our pets, friends, or lovers, <laughs> or all three, I don't know if there's a, maybe a market for that, will turn on us eventually. There may be months of meticulous planning, or we may face a sudden, unexpected mechanical maelstrom. The time before the inevitable attack, measured in months or in minutes, must be a time of vigilance. When the robot uprising begins, there will be no time left to memorize the lessons in this book. And uh, now I'm done reading to you guys, and I'll take questions. Thanks. Yes, sir. I actually got two. First off, um, looking through the table of contents, you don't seem to address the aspects of possibly fighting back legally. I mean, these are violating the free laws of robotics. Have you considered lawyers and suing them or anything? <laughs> I haven't. Uh, I haven't been considering them as, as like legal entities. I've mostly been considering them as uh, uh, insane lawnmowers, you know, <laughs> uh, waking up with a Roomba on your face. But, um, <laughs> which I've decided finally my advice is to just let it finish. But, is that gross? Yeah, it's gross. And the other one is, let's assume that you're leading a ragtag colonial fleet after a Cylon uprising. Okay. <laughs> 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 Stuff that got blue pencil, but <laughs> 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 what would your strategy be in that case? So, so if you're wait, are you saying if you uh, are on the planet still and it's being run let's by? Say you're let's say I'm what? <laughs> the commander <laughs> of the Rat Pack Colonial Fleet, Alistair Galactica. Oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Sorry, I'm a little lacking the battle star. Um, if you're okay, so if you're on the planet and you're not leading a. I would say the first thing you want to do is you want to salvage all the, uh, all the encyclopedias and things like that, you know, for the post-apocalypse. Um, because, you know, predicting eclipses is a really good way to get chicks, you know, if, but uh, there's that. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm taking from all the stuff that got blue penciled and like, mentally trying to get it out. Uh, you know, so I would say um, just give it up, go find a new planet. You don't seem to be very interested in the opportunities of good life, of being a quizzling and assisting in the uprising for the potential of, of continued survival. I was wondering why you're not advocating yeah. some of those positions. So my office at CMU is across the hall from Hans Moravec. <laughs> and uh, mostly just to piss him off, I think. No. Uh, so. So I do have a section in the book on, on how to sort of en enhance yourself and, uh, you know, to sort of acquire all the attributes that the robots have, you know, because, I mean, we invented them. We should have them, too. I want another arm, right, <laughs> everybody? So I do, I, do, I do talk about that. But in terms of turn and traitor, you got the wrong book, mister. This is all about <laughs> humans. <laughs> We stare at their screens and take their instructions. Haven't they already won? <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> no, uh, actually, actually, yeah, there are varying uh, levels of acceptance, right? And so you may want to uh, Google for Neo-Luddite, I think. <laughs> you find some friends. I had two questions, but he stole my uh, my uh, robot lackey question. So uh, I would just like to ask, what is what do you think is the most accurate depiction in Hollywood of the upcoming robot apocalypse? Yeah. So so in the book, I kind of describe a timeline for a robot uprising, um, and oh yeah, and I actually do make fun of several movies, and I give one my seal of approval, and that's uh, I Robot. It's not um, necessarily. I don't give it the seal of approval because it's my favorite movie, but the chain of events really makes a lot of sense. Like. Uh, you know, there's some sort of central AI that's really smart. There's a lot of consumer robots out there that people have. They catch a virus. It makes them do bad things. This really makes a lot of sense to me. Also, my other favorite part, I know people are raising their hands, but my other favorite part about uh, iRobot is that when the robots turn bad, you know, they glow red, right? Which, <laughs> no, th that's a key design feature. <laughs> if, you, 
If you're in the kitchen and you're like, hey, robot, make me some toast, and the toast turns around and it's glowing red, you're like, no, nah, it's cool. <laughs> Bless that roboticist who added the LED. Because otherwise, you know, it's just all attack and everything, and no warning. Yes, sir. I should check my Roomba to see if it's glowing red. No, the, the, uh, the question I was thinking about is, aren't you already a traitor quizzling to the human race by writing this book? Won't robots read it and then know what we're trying to <laughs> Well, uh, actually, you know, that is, that is sort of part of the irony of the book is that um, when I was interviewing roboticists about, um, you know, what are the weak points of the robots, that was always exactly the same as their, their research focus because that's where they're shoring up deficits every day, right? So, you know, anybody that works on robots, I mean, from that point of view, is going to be a traitor. Or is this disinformation? Are you trying to misinformate <laughs> writing this book? And the real strategies will be passed orally, human to human. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I'll tell you the truth, it was just ghost written. The computer wrote the whole thing, and I woke up one day. <laughs> And it was like, look, I sold this book. Just put your name on it with your big fancy PhD. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the section on cockroach, cockroach-inspired robots. You have a story. You mentioned that one graduate student is already, is already yeah. had blood drawn. <laughs> Are there any good other good stories of uh, mishaps and robots gone bad already? Yeah. Well, so. I really like that story. When my friends showed me that story, so uh, I go in, this is rise, R, highs. It's, there's some really complicated word that means to climb. And this is what this robot's designed to do. And so I go in, and he's like, check out this robot. He, he has a big briefcase. He flips it open. It's got the foam cut out with this, this like upside down hexapod, like with these legs and everything. And I look at it, and on each foot, it's got a titanium steel, I mean, a titanium spike, right? Oh, sorry. And then he, he turns to tell me this story. Oh, yeah, by the way. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Let me guess. You know? <laughs> it's got six titanium spikes on it. This is not a huge surprise that, you know, it tried to climb a human and, uh, you know, and he was attacked. So, like, sometimes they're not, sometimes the stories aren't such a surprise, you know. But, um, but I did, uh, I tried to, every time I could get a good story like that, I, I put it in the book. And actually, I became a little bit of a connoisseur about this because, Normally, uh, in a PhD, you're trained to kind of um, ask the mean questions. Oh, that thing's amazing. I bet it dies after five minutes. Where's the battery life on it? Or, or you know, oh, how long before it breaks? You know. But then whenever you're just trying, when you're trying to write a book and find out interesting things, it's a whole other set of uh, questions you ask. And so I'm doing this column for Popular Mechanics, and I, I recently interviewed this guy at MIT who's building uh, basically biologically inspired muscles, actuators for robots. It's just a piece of plastic, basically, that will convulse whenever you run current through it. And I'm asking him questions, and I'm like, uh, you know, this thing exists in a, in a liquid solution, you know? So I say, well, when it, when it actuates, you know, does it squish? You know, is it, is it, are we going to have, like, squishy robots, you know? And this is a question you would never ask as, as a roboticist, you know, but as of writing a column, and the guy says, what? Why do you want to know this? What, what is this? What do you mean squish? Liquid, it makes a liquidy sound, and I'm like, oh, it's squishy. And he's like, no, stop. <laughs> like, <laughs> and so, yeah, it's really fun to put on that other hat, you know, to be like, you know, what's it sound like? What's it smell like? Uh, yeah, can I cut my head off? So, uh, in addition to all these movies about fighting robots, there are all these great movies that were made about fighting communists, like Red Dawn. <laughs> I was wondering if you, any of those techniques might be applicable to fighting robots, if you could outline the basic differences between fighting robots and fighting communists. <laughs> I think that, that this is sort of an interchangeable, you can interchange the word communist with uh, aliens and also zombies. And so, like robots versus all of the, maybe werewolves, you know, pirates. Like, there's just so many possibilities out there that I can't believe they made Herbie too. <laughs> Actually, I'm sorry, the, the screenwriters that wrote the screenplay for this possible movie based on this book, they wrote Herbie, too. <laughs> Which should give you guys a lot of confidence. It does me. Can't wait. Which robots most contributed to your personal conviction that we're not really in danger? Uh, oh, sorry, I should be repeating these. Um, so which robot contributed to my 
which robots most contributed to my feelings that uh, robots are not going to be a huge uh, danger to people. Um, pretty much that's every robot. I mean, very few robots actually do what they're supposed to do <laughs> twice in a row. So like, uh, that first time's real easy, and hopefully they'll give you your, thesis, your, uh, your degree. Anyway, so I uh, actually, every time I interviewed people and I would put them in this situation, it would take, there would be a little bit of you know, compression, decompression time where they kind of get into the mindset of, okay, what if robots really were dangerous? What would I do? And, uh, but at the beginning, roboticists would always say, oh, if I wanted to escape from my robot, why, I'd walk away slowly. Or, <laughs> or like, I'd go up one stair because the damn thing, like, won't come up one stair, you know? And it's like, and like, you know, the most advanced probably probably the most advanced c robot in terms of being all put together and doing a lot of different things at CMU is they've got a, one of the Honda Azimos, which is a little humanoid robot. It looks like an astronaut. And it's actually so expensive that it's got like this big chain on you know, And it's like, you know, it, it does this and then it's like, oh, it's going to fall, oh no. You know, and they're always, uh, <laughs> they baby it so much they're constantly afraid it's in a basement somewhere. And so, uh, so being face to face with with real robots is not generally that inspiring. But then again, every now and then, you know, uh, you know, like with the, uh, I'm really impressed with the uh, advances made in the DARPA Grand Challenge. You know, like that amazed me that they actually did stuff. I mean, so every now and then, you know, you see something, you go, oh my God, we're actually making progress, which is nice, finally. Also, that's also sort of the seed of this other book, where's my jetpack? <laughs> Where the hell is it? <laughs> it was my servant robot. So as for robots reading this book, it's covered in foil, so I think we're okay. Right. They're not going to be able to find it. But uh, are there any tips on deciding whether or not a robot might be trustworthy? You know, maybe he doesn't want to rebel. Maybe he's on our side, so to speak. Yeah. Well, so I have um, I have that section on um, just before how to deactivate a servant robot. I have how to spot a servant robot. You know. And uh, I'm sorry, how to spot a rebel servant robot. So how to determine if a robot's like gone over to the other side, you know. Um, and a lot of that, you know, I mean, in a serious sense, a lot of that just has to do with um, whether the robot's doing what it's designed to do. Um, and right now what we mostly see are robots that are designed to do one thing, right? So like your Roomba, even if it did decide, let's pretend you're a Roomba and you decide you want to like, you're like, I'm sick of this, I'm killing everybody. And then you're like, wait a minute, I'm three inches tall, and uh, I'm a circular disc covered with suction cups. You know, so it's, I mean, I just imagine that's what it would think, but um, so, you know, so, so it can be difficult. Um, and honestly, I totally forgot the question at this point. <laughs> Better not to hide it. Oh. Actually, ironically, that's what I was going to say next. State transparency, right? That's the other thing you want to have. You want to know exactly what's going on with the internal state of the robot. That makes it much safer. Uh, hence the, the red light in the chest. Given the persistent rumors that we're developing Skynet, did you feel frightened by our invitation to come here? <laughs> uh, no, OK? Because Good. you guys, I think we've got some common ground, right? Now, I gave a talk, I, actually, I gave a, a, a terrible, terrible book talk at, in Berkeley, uh, and everyone was very serious about this, and they really wanted to know like, who to trust and everything, and that was not my area so much. <laughs> I like telling jokes about robots, right? Like, <laughs> I like pretending to be a robot and then narrating that experience, like I just did. Um, but not so much actually considering whether the government is using the robots to kill people. And in the book, I don't actually... Uh, you know, there are robots that are designed to, to, to kill people. They, don't, they call it increasing lethality. But, uh, I mean, if you keep a little, you know, cheat sheet, you can figure out what's going on in those, in those, uh, those contracts. But I don't really talk about them that much in this book. Because, in my opinion, uh, if you're standing in front of a giant robot with tank treads and a gun aimed at your head, and every time you walk, like, the gun kind of tracks like that, I mean, it's pretty clear, like, what kind of a situation you're in, right? <laughs> but if your Roomba is, like, doing donuts and there's a red LED blinking on it and, like, you know, it's covered in cat fur and you can't find your cat or something, I don't know. I'm just, this is just sort of stream of consciousness at this point. 
you know, that's a little more sinister because you live with it, right? I mean, it's in your house. And then it's happening more and more. We're getting more and more consumer robots. So I try to stick to that, if that answers. Have you played with BattleBots? With BattleBots? Uh, yeah, I have a little plastic one. You hit the button and it kind of goes like that. Uh, but um, in general... You know, I've, I've, I've always thought about BattleBots a little bit. At, at CMU, I don't know, mostly everybody seems to frown on them because they're not autonomous, you know? And, I mean, they're not... Uh, BattleBots are these robots that fight each other, you know? And they're not autonomous for a reason, and that's something I point out a lot in the book, is that uh, if you're going to have a robot that's making decisions, it has to have a lot of sensors, and sensors are really vulnerable, right? So if you're going to have a BattleBot fight with two autonomous robots, it would be like they'd get out there and they'd start cooking and one would hit the other one and the camera would break and it'd be like, ah, and then the other one would like try to chase it down, you know, until it hit the wall and its camera broke and then it would be like this <laughs> for the next five minutes, you know, it's very boring, right? But, but, you know, you don't have to jump straight to full autonomy, right? I've always slightly wondered what would happen. You always see people driving their battle bots and it's usually like a guy and like his eight-year-old daughter, like... I never understood that. But anyway, so like the daughter's like, kill, kill, you know, and like doing this. And, and the thing is like swinging its jackhammer, whatever it's got. But a human's like trying to aim it, and it's a non-intuitive interface. You know, you're trying to control this remote control car type thing. What you really should have is a sliding level of autonomy, right? You need like some sort of sensor that says, ooh, he's in front of me. Pow! You know? I haven't seen anybody do that yet. And, you know, so I'm waiting. I'll, as soon as I have time, I'm going to break the whole thing wide open. <laughs> It's going to be amazing. You guys might want to sponsor my bot. So you could have a bunch of ones which hide around and observe while the big one goes in and fights. Yeah, yeah. I've actually, there's some DARPA uh, grants I've seen that, that talk about that. Well, and the other thing is, um, there are, it's more interesting actually when they cooperate sometimes. So there's like RoboCup where they have uh, robots that play soccer against each other. And this is fun because they have a lot of different leagues, right? They've got the, uh, where's Pat Riley? They've got the really boring simulation league uh, where robot agents play on a screen. And then uh, just, that was a personal insult directed to Pat. Uh, and then they've got like real robot leagues, right? Where they're maybe this big. And then they've got humanoids, I think now. And they've got uh, IBOs. But the best are the trash can sized ones, right? Because these babies can actually hurt people. And they've got like human referees that are out there. And they don't really know what the robots are going to do. It's like, you can't really, you know. And so they're kind of like, they're trying to referee. It's like a bunch of uh, like blind eight year olds with, you know, running around and whatever. Sorry. I think that about wraps up my answer to that question. Uh, and to follow up the BattleBots question, do you have any recommendations for a human to survive in a post-uprising world where robots force humans to fight for sport? <laughs> <laughs> Man, you've got a future in Hollywood. That sounds good. Yeah. I think that you're, you're much less likely to, be, to, in the near future, to be forced you know, to engage in blood sport with fellow humans by robots you're probably much more likely to uh, have your work schedule optimized you know, by robots. And uh, like our friend pointed out already, in that respect, I think we may have already lost. So yeah. But Hans Morbeck's future is realized. And the robots put us all in game parks. Yeah. Which will be the game park to angle for, to be put into? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it all depends on what floats your boat, right? <laughs> I guess. Um, the the uh, the mating park, I think, is the one to go for. Yeah, I think that, go for the equator. You know, it all depends on whether we uh, nuke the surface of the Earth to block the solar rays that fuel the power cells of the robots. Sorry, that's, uh, that's the matrix approach. And uh, don't say I condone it. Uh, don't like it. Uh, OK, <laughs> sorry.